Over 3 million children in the United States are involved in abuse and neglect reports annually. Approximately 47 out of 1,000 children are reported as victims of some form of maltreatment. At least three children die as a result of child abuse each day. The statistics are frightening. Child abuse and neglect is becoming more and more common in our society. As a provider dealing with a wide variety of children and parents, it is important to understand the issue in depth. In this program, we will discuss the four types of child abuse and how to recognize them, the laws that govern reporting, and how to aid in the prevention of maltreatment and abuse. Initially, we need to determine exactly what is meant by child abuse. There are four main categories, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect. Physical abuse is any non-accidental physical injury to a child caused by a parent or caretaker which results in or threatens serious injury. Some indicators to look for in the physical abuse of a child include unexplained bruises, lacerations, welts, bumps, fractures, and burns. Emotional warning signs may include being overly mature, withdrawn, unusually neat, or verbalizing the abuse, or a fear of going home. Indications of an abusive caretaker who abuses may include an individual who describes the child in a consistently negative manner, is a harsh disciplinarian, and conceals or misleads the provider about a child's injuries. More and more providers are being made aware of shaken infant syndrome, where the rapid movement of a baby's head during shaking leads to bruising and bleeding in the brain. This can result in cerebral palsy, blindness, seizures, and even death. Indicators of shaken infant syndrome include dilated pupils, seizures or spasms, a swollen head coupled with nausea, and blood spots or blood pooling in the eyes. Sexual abuse is an adult or another child in a position of power using a child for sexual gratification or allowing another person to do so. Foreign matter in the genitals, bruised or dilated genitals, urinary tract infections, and difficulty or pain in walking are all indicators of sexual abuse. Behavioral indicators may include sleep disorders, seductive or self-destructive behavior, running away, or artwork depicting sexual themes. Behavioral signs of an abusive caretaker include someone who is extremely protective of family privacy and does not allow the child to be involved in extracurricular or developmentally appropriate activities like being with friends or dating. Verbal harassment, threats, and the systematic destruction of a child's self-esteem are all part of the mental and emotional harm inflicted by emotional abuse. Emotional abuse and neglect can and should be reported there are many behavioral indicators of emotional abuse, including hypochondria, apathy, hyperactivity, obesity, and speech disorders, such as stammering and stuttering. Extreme behavioral indicators may include fire setting, head banging or hair pulling, and sadomasochistic behavior toward animals and other children. Caretakers are likely to reject, ignore, terrorize, and isolate a child. Neglect means depriving a child of conditions necessary for normal development, including food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, and supervision. Physical characteristics include children who are underweight, have dark circles under their eyes, are unclean, and have immature physical development. Often neglected children are constantly tired and hungry and seek inappropriate affection from providers. Caretakers in these situations may be substance abusers and have a chaotic lifestyle, which might include loss of job, income, or housing. Providers need to be aware of what kind of children are at risk for the four types of child abuse. Children who are mentally or physically disabled, or colicky and illness prone, hyperactive or demanding children, and children whose caretakers perceive them as difficult can be considered at risk. Difficult for a caretaker might include children who are perceived as the wrong sex at birth or viewed as bad, ugly, or stupid despite the child appearing normal. Stressors in a caretaker's life may also mean a child is at risk. Some of these stressors may include divorce, death of a loved one, loss of income, and illness or injury. Research shows that the children who are most at risk in terms of abuse and neglect are young children. And because young children are most at risk, and they can also die because of abuse or neglect, it's very important that providers have information about indicators of abuse 
And in addition to that, what we know is, is that if we can identify abuse and get to children and their families early on, early intervention in terms of prevention really does make a difference. Patty, you've worked with a lot of providers. What responsibilities do you feel they assume when they care for children? Well, I think that they assume many responsibilities, but probably one of the biggest responsibilities that they assume is providing a safe and secure environment in their home or their facility. But also, to know and be knowledgeable enough about child abuse and neglect that they, to the best of their ability, can make certain that the child is in a safe and secure environment in their own home as well. Despite the physical and emotional pain of child abuse and neglect, few children will directly reveal what has happened to them. Reasons for this may include that the child is too young to understand abuse and neglect is wrong, is fearful of the abuser, or feels that he or she deserved the abuse. But providers need to be aware that sometimes children give hints about an abusive home situation. A child may make subtle references to angry parents or uncomfortable touches. Questions may center around the abuse of an imaginary friend. And intervention should be made immediately. The child should be asked to say more about the statement or question. Unless the child's response clearly shows a non-abusive circumstance, a report must be made and the child not questioned any further. Less often, a child may openly disclose abuse or neglect. This is reason to believe the child has been a victim of abuse and a report must be made to the proper authorities. Providers need to be aware that all the available evidence shows children rarely make false allegations of abuse. In one study of over 500 sexual abuse allegations, only 2% were false reports made by children. We have already discussed some ways to recognize child abuse. Now, let's look at reporting suspected abuse. The law states that any individual is required by law to report suspected child abuse to the proper authorities. When reporting abuse and neglect, you'll be asked the child's name and the parent's name, ages, address, phone number, and the nature of the abuse and other important information. The caller may remain anonymous. If the report warrants investigation, it will be investigated in a timely manner. Remember, reporting in good faith protects the complainant from any liability, even if the report proves unfounded. But willful failure to report or malicious reporting opens a person up to criminal or civil liability. After the investigation, if abuse is substantiated, decisions can vary from intensive in-home services, referrals to community agencies, to placing children with a relative in foster care or a group home temporarily and having the accused abuser prosecuted in criminal court. Thus, it is important for caregivers to discuss the case only with those that need to know about it and, most importantly, recognize their own feelings about the suspected abuse. Providers must realize that maltreatment can take on what some would view as acceptable forms. There are more subtle forms of maltreatment that leave no mark but can leave lasting psychological scars. Among these may be children having to take on a role that they are not developmentally ready for, such as caring for an even younger sibling. Another important issue is recognizing the difference between punishment and discipline. Punishment emphasizes past offenses, focuses on punishment and not the problem, emphasizes the child's failure, and makes the child pay rather than change. Often, punishment teaches children to avoid adults when they are in trouble. Discipline teaches what is expected, expects children to improve behavior, is appropriate to the problem, and teaches children that adults can be trusted to help them. Discipline techniques include setting limits, making rules, being consistent, giving and recognizing positive attention, and providing alternatives. Punishment techniques include using threats, yelling and scolding, spanking, and using shame and sarcasm. Child care providers may be reluctant to report caretakers who may be friends or colleagues. Providers may feel that they have misunderstood a situation or may be afraid of causing more trouble for the child, parents, or themselves. However, they are under no legal obligation to tell caretakers they have made a report. If you do feel obligated to discuss the issue with the parents, you should call Child Protection first. Be direct and professional. Do not give false reassurances or comment on the credibility of the stories. Instead, describe your responsibility to reporting according to a law. You also might consider having another professional present to act as a witness and provide emotional support.
Providers must remember that the child comes first. Children cannot protect themselves. Often, children must rely on caring adults to intervene on their behalf. Providers need to recognize that reporting suspected child abuse is the first step toward bringing help to children and families affected by child abuse. As a child care provider, there are ways you can protect children and yourself from abusive situations. Initially, you can make the environment of your child care facility a safe one for children. Ensure that your room arrangement and any outdoor areas allow you to see all the children all the time. Remove any papers or posters that cover windows into child activity areas. And be certain you have no broken, sharp, or poisonous materials in the environment. Have a child care policy that includes your legal responsibility for reporting child abuse and neglect. Share that policy with caretakers as it is critical to your protection and to that of the families you serve. This policy should clearly spell out what you and the caretakers can expect from each other while dealing with the care of the child. It also offers you a chance to discuss your values and practices with a caretaker before problems occur. A discipline policy is very important. It should describe your rules and how you will handle misbehavior. It should also describe what methods you will not use and what you expect of parents in helping to enforce limits. A parental access policy would state the parent's rights to have access to their child without advance notice at any time during business hours. A substitutes and helpers policy relates how you would choose and train any substitutes or helpers you employ in your facility. A pickup policy describes what you will require to allow someone other than the caretaker to pick up the child. A policy about how abuse allegations against staff will be handled. These and other policies should be made available to parents and a copy kept in your business files. Remember, child abuse can occur in any child care setting given the right combination of factors, motivation, opportunity, and a vulnerable child. A provider can also offer parents input and resources on the prevention of child abuse and neglect. An overall approach to child abuse prevention must involve services at three levels. Primary prevention involves programs and services designated to promote the general welfare of all children and their families, such as the program you are now watching. Secondary prevention is identifying and then helping families who are at high risk for abuse. Tertiary prevention includes services provided after the occurrence of abuse or neglect and is designed to prevent any reoccurrence of abuse. There is much a provider can do to provide resources at all three levels of prevention. Routine discussions with new parents in such areas as proper clothing, equipment and emotional support in preparation for child care, or baby proofing a house, toilet training and preparing for school should be services offered by the daycare provider. Written literature and pamphlets on all aspects of parenting are readily available from many state and national resources and are typically free of charge. Providers should be aware of referral sources in the community that caretakers can go to during times of family stress. These can include self-help groups, support groups for new parents, and parenting and life skills education classes. There are many state and national agencies ready to provide information and education to families in need. It is very important that providers be familiar with what services are available to families in stress in their community because caretakers often look to the provider for guidance and information regarding their children. They trust you and so the more information that you have to help them then you can intervene in situations that may be abusive without your assistance. The other important point of knowing about what is available in your community is that you can bring those professionals into your facility or your home to provide training to your staff to familiarize them with what they can do to help families as well. Sadly, there is no way of determining the true extent of child abuse and neglect because it usually occurs in private. It is a complex problem that is not confined to any one family, racial, ethnic, cultural, socioeconomic, or religious group. Child abuse and neglect must be discovered and reported so that the child can be protected. Ultimately, child abuse and neglect are community problems which require community solutions. Implementing solutions to this widespread problem demands every person in the community become involved in the process. 
As a provider, learning the signs and symptoms of child abuse and neglect will enable you to recognize when a family begins to show the risk factors for abuse or neglect and be able to offer services or referrals to prevent the problem before a child is hurt. Based on their studies, researchers suggest that one person can make a difference in a child's life. 